I was joking with my mom today that I was just going to come up here and say, hey, we're going to watch a, a quick video and then just put on the Passion of the Christ and then come back and say, let's pray. <clears throat> and you guys would say, Mark, that was your best message yet. That's for sure. Um, I'm, I'm going to be straight with you guys. Uh, we're going to be in probably the most well-known text in the Bible, All right? John 3.16. Even if you don't have much background at church, you've seen this verse waved at you if you ever watch a football game or a basketball game, right? They trot out to kick a field goal or the extra point and someone's up there holding up John 3, 16. It's a verse that even those who aren't necessarily believers in Christ have at least a frame of reference for this text, So we're going to be in John 3, 16. I'm going to read a bit of 17, but predominantly we're going to be in 16. Uh, But before we get into it, I want to set it up. Uh, I've been married uh, to my wife, Jessica, for uh, about 13 years now. Uh, Or we've been together for about 13 years. We've been married for about 12 of those as of February. Uh, Now that said, that first year of marriage was a bit of a nightmare, now, some of you women I can hear already are like, if he's about to air, I would kill my husband. If he aired the dirty on. Well, I've got a text from my wife right here. It says, I, Jessica, of sound body and mind, <laughs> give Mark permission to air our dirty laundry in front of God and the people in this church, and you owe me big time for this. <laughs> Kissy face, angry face. Poop emoji. The last one was from Owen. I love you. Pick up some milk on the way home. (laughs) But our first year of marriage was rough. Uh, It's where we had by far the most fights that we've done as a couple. Uh, I lost my job and was delivering pizza. My car got stolen, so I was delivering the pizzas in Jessica's car. She had this debilitating back pain that made it so she couldn't get out of bed two or three times a week. She had to quit her job, and and we were just on edge all the time. And in the midst of a lot of strife, we felt trapped. And I remember sitting in the car one night after getting home from delivering pizza, thinking, God, this certainly cannot be the rest of my life. I literally thought that that for Jessica in particular, that it would just be better if we weren't married anymore, which then led to the biggest fight we ever had. And in the middle of that, though, it kind of struck me that I had been discipled and, and trained by our culture in what love is. There's this massive moment for me of enlightenment. I'd been trained, and I didn't even know I'd been trained, but everything around me, from movies to sitcoms to songs, uh, on what love is. And our modern cultural kind of, this predominant idea of love is this, this kind of shallow, hollow, ridiculous, empty, impossible to feel safe in type of emotive love. In fact, it's a love that looks down on a deep, genuine, biblical love and would, and would view it as unhealthy rather than this modern version of love that is actually unhealthy. So let me unpack that. Predominantly, that, that's not everyone, but mostly love is purely emotive. It can be fallen out of or it can be fallen into depending really on on how happy the other person is making us. So really, we don't love the other person. We love us. That's what we love. Love is, you make me so happy, so I love you. But that's just you loving you. That's not you loving someone else. When we first got married, I fell for this idea, hook, line, and sinker. Like, I I love Jesus, my wife loves Jesus, we're good people, and yet there is just no shalom in our home. Because my expectation was that Jessica was going to do whatever I needed her to do to keep me happy. And her expectation was that I was going to do anything I could do to keep her happy. And both of us were just trying to fix one another. And it did not work well for us. 
So you take this idea of love to mean the simple kind of emotive fluttering of the heart. But how could you feel safe in that? If what love is is you making me happy, then you have to be on your guard all the time. You can never show your weakness. Because if I see your weakness, I'm definitely not going to like that. And if you watch 20-somethings date, it's like used car salesmen. And if you are a used car salesman, I'm not trying to be offensive. <laughs> I'm simply saying, uh, you're not, you're, you're not going to point out the defects. You're just looking at the strengths. You're not going to show them that that back door doesn't actually open, right? You're dating, it's all just, you, you know, you're so great, and you're such a romantic, and, and you're such a gentleman. And then you get married, and you're like, hey, this door doesn't open, and you're like, oh, I didn't tell you about that? Well, too late, you already bought it. <laughs> and because of that, we have this inability to actually be fully known. And when your weaknesses are seen by your spouse, you'll just be forced to justify them. And of course, the, the, the way we like to do that the most is to remind the other person of their weaknesses. So now you have someone who's judging you for your weakness, and in defense of, of that, your, of your weaknesses, you're going to point out theirs, and this is just a recipe for disaster. But that's how we define love in our modern world. Listen to people talk about it. They, they fell out of love. I, I just don't love him anymore. In fact, the thing that's probably most frowned on in our culture when it comes to love is someone who loves by will what the Hebrews called ahava. It was a love of the will. It was a love that says, I'm not going anywhere. And that's not even romanticized. This is not rose petals and violins and candles and, and oh, honey, I'm just not going anywhere. No, it's, it's our house is on fire. There's a knife being flung past my head. You're hunkered down. There's chaos everywhere. And you're saying, I'm not going anywhere anywhere, no matter what. Ahava says, I've seen the ugly side of you, and I'm staying. And yet, we would view that in our culture as unhealthy. Surely, God does not want that for you. Life is just too short. Are you really going to spend time like that? In our culture, love is flippant. It can shift and change at any given moment. It's not sustaining and it's not safe. If you want to try to get a handle on why people are, are putting off marriage or not getting married at all, you only need to look at how we're defining love. Why would anyone want to do that? We find its roots in, in the Roman Empire and their view of love, and we, we just lapped it up. Every time my, my dog drinks water, uh, she drinks water like she hasn't had anything to drink in three days. She won't stop unless we stop her until she throws up. She just laps it all up. Well, that's how we are with this idea of emotional love. We just lap it up. If love is purely emotive, then what's to stop Cupid in his little diaper from lighting me up when I go to the store after this to pick up that milk, and all of a sudden, I just don't love Jessica anymore? I love this woman over in aisle six because she couldn't reach the barbecue chips and I got to be her hero, right? You could do that. It's Cupid. I just fell out of love with Jessica and now I'm in love with this woman in aisle six picking up a case of Mountain Dew, All right? This is the kind of nonsense that we're lapping up and we love it. It's what every Hallmark movie is based on. In fact, we don't even have language for love anymore. And I know this because I can say, I love tacos. I love my dog. Some of you are willing to say that you love a cat, which is the greatest sin of all. And yet, you would still say you love your spouse, or you love your parents, or you love your sister and your brothers. We don't even have language that allow us to be deeply in love. We don't even know what we're saying anymore. Most of the time when we say, I love you, what we're saying is, you make me happy, you make me glad, and so I love you. This is the weakest form of love. It will not sustain moving forward. It requires some ahava 
in order to make it in the long run, in order to be safe, in order to grow as people. See, that first year of marriage, I didn't love Jessica. I loved me. That's who I loved. I really, really dug Jessica, but I loved me. In fact, Jessica was, was a bit of a problem because she wasn't making me as happy and as big of a deal as I thought I was. And that created conflict. So here's what I'm saying all this to you. I'm saying to the, this to us because if we don't understand what love actually is, if we don't have an understanding of, of the depth of it, if we're not rooted in it and anchored in it, then, we, we, when, then when we talk about God's love for us, we have no frame of reference. It won't feel as spectacular as it's supposed to because we'll feel like we just don't measure up. We feel like we have to do everything right in order for God to love us. We can't show our weakness. We eat up this emotional love idea and we breathe into it every time we watch TV and movies or listen to songs on the radio. It's the air of a love that is not unconditional, but rather very much conditional. And we're loved as long as we can perform accordingly. But that's not love as the Bible teaches it. So it's important for us to move away from this popular, predominant understanding of love and get into the biblical version of love. Yeah, I want emotions. I want my chest to flutter when Jessica walks in the room. And it still happens by the grace of God. Because now I not only love this woman, I actually like her. But there have been days that it had to be a hava. On our honeymoon, I was sick as a dog. We were stuck in this tiny little hotel room in Portugal. And I would go from hot flashes where I was sweating so profusely we'd have to change the sheets to a chill that was so deep I couldn't stop shivering. And my lungs felt like they were full of liquid and I could barely breathe. And I had this barking cough that wouldn't stop. Nothing about that to my wife is sexy. <laughs> Nothing about me trying to crawl to the toilet to vomit made my wife go, boy, I'm glad I married this one. <laughs> Do you know what she needed in that moment? She needed a hava. She needed to tell me, I'm not going anywhere. And she had to lean on her vows real fast. On that day where you're exhausted and just being the worst parts of you, what you need is a hava. You need someone who says, yeah, I've seen that. It's ugly, but I love you. I'm not going anywhere. So with me setting up love that way, let's look at this very popular verse, John 3, 16. In fact, many of you probably won't even need to look at it. I'm going to read the ESV, and then I'll even get some of you old school, a little of the King's James, because you probably memorized it in King James. Uh, but it goes like this. For God so loved the world. If you write in your Bible, if you circle things in your Bible, if you highlight things in your Bible, I would encourage you, underline, highlight, circle the word so. It's a great word. For God so loved the world, as in there was a volume of that love that God had for the world that he's expressing in this text. It wasn't a little bit of what loved. He so loved the world. And what he means by the world is, is not the, the planet Earth, but he loved inhabitants of the planet Earth. For God so loved the world. The next part of the text, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now what you have here is the love of God initiating towards us. Again, this whole thing is spectacular. For God so loved the world that he moves towards those on earth. He moves towards us. Here's why that's important. I, I'm, a, I'm a fool in certain areas. Seth made me do this thing in Proverbs, and I'm a fool in most areas, actually, to be honest. But I'm not a fool in all areas. I, I'm well aware that some of you are, are struggling in life. There are probably addictions in this place. There's certainly fear in this place. There are people who are struggling with depression. 
There are those of you that, that your marriages are just, you know, you, you got the kids dressed coming here. It stressed you out, but you got them in their new shoes and somebody probably screamed at you, but you got them here just in time. You argued as you pulled into the parking lot. I told you we should have just left earlier. And then you walked into this place feeling like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And somebody said, it's good to see you. And you lied and said, good to see you too, with a smile on your face. The reality of your life is that we're broken. And some of us feel lonely or desperate or angry. And here you are. There are those in you who are struggling in regards to purity. There are people that are flirting with a, a person who's not their spouse. And those are, I, I go on and on and on. But what we just saw is that God, in his initiating love, leaned towards us, not away from us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's important for us to notice just a couple of things here. First, when he calls Jesus the son of God, that does not mean that he's born from some goddess up there. And he's kind of the best of God's kids, and he was sent down to rescue us. That's not what happened. He is begotten of from the same substance of. He is God in the flesh. He's not just some magic man. He is God. Christmas time, we say he's Emmanuel, God with us. So God, in his leaning in, meeting us where we are, right in the middle of our junk, Christ is the righteousness that we would need. Your righteousness, you at your best, is never going to be adequate to cancel the record of debt. You're never going to be good enough to save yourselves ever. That's why God in his great love in which he loves us leaned in. He wasn't repulsed by, but he came to rescue. John 3.17 is going to say, the son of man did not come to condemn the world, but rather to save the world. Christ has come to condemn, <clears throat> has come not to condemn, but rather to remove from you that condemnation. Now, how does he do that? God so loved the world that he gives the only begotten son. He becomes God in the flesh, Emmanuel. He lives a perfect, spotless, righteous life that you and I, by the grace of God, are given, granted, imputed to us, so when God sees us, he actually sees the righteousness of the acts of Christ. Then the cross of Jesus Christ, Good Friday, is going to be that moment when all our sin and rebellion, past, present, and future, are put on Christ, and he absorbs them fully. Owen, my five-year-old, he asked, why do they call Good Friday, Good Friday, if that's when they killed Jesus? Now, that's a great question. That's not a five-year-old question. He, he is a genius, obviously. <laughs> but let me tell you my favorite thing about Good Friday. My favorite thing about Good Friday is that God publicly, efficiently, and for all time completely outed me. He completely outed me. And now that outing has set me free. Here's what I mean by that. God publicly acknowledges Mark Jackson is going to need a savior. Mark Jackson is going to fall short. He is far from perfect. He is going to need me desperately. God outed me so I can stand in front of you and say, hey, the first year of my marriage was hard. Because I don't have to pretend my entire marriage with my wife was euphoric bliss. It wasn't. We needed a savior. I don't have to be more than I am. I can just go, you know, sometimes I still doubt. I have to preach the gospel to myself a lot. It's hard for me to believe that God loves me like I am. I think maybe he'll love some future better version of me that's better than the one right now. But I have to preach that to myself. I have to quote those, those scriptures to myself often. I get set free by what? By Good Friday. 
because God already told you that I'm awful. And God already told me that you are awful. How great is that? <laughs> I don't have to pretend I'm anything for you guys. I don't have to play a part. I don't have to be a puppet. I don't have to do any of that. Why? Because of Good Friday. Jesus set me free from all of that. God said, I'm just going to let you know everyone is awful. Bam. Good Friday. In spite of everything, he loves me so much. Now, you all have to be honest because I've outed you. We don't get to pretend because I've declared and I've decreed upon all of you that we are broken. We all are. And that's why we call Good Friday Good Friday. Because on it, we are outed and our sins are absorbed on the cross of Christ. So we're here, brothers and sisters, so loved by God, God leaning into us, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever or whosoever, if your king's jamesing on me, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now a couple of things to note here. First and foremost, notice that not everyone is going to benefit from the Lord initiating his love towards us. It says, whoever believes in him. In who? Jesus, the only begotten son. Who did what? Who lived a righteous life on our behalf and who died our death. So whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but will have eternal life. Will not perish, but have eternal life. Cuts into a couple of different directions. Eternal life. Yes, in the future and for eternity. That's eternal life. But we also learn in John 10.10 10, that he's talking about the fullness of life now. It's not just that we get heaven, but even now Christ and our belief in Christ grants us fullness of life. But in the same way, that means perishing would not just be eternal perishing, but actual perishing even in the here and now. Let's talk about belief. Because I think we have to do a little bit of work around the word belief. It says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This is not intellectual assent. It's not just, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. To believe in Jesus in John 3, 16 is to believe he is who he says he is, and he did what he said he did. A lot of people believe in Jesus like we believe in Abraham Lincoln. He's kind of a historical figure who did some pretty cool stuff and then died an untimely death. No, belief is that I believe he is who he says he is and he did what he said he did. And that puts us in a bit of a bind. Puts us in a corner because Jesus said that he is God and that he's the only way to get to him. The Bible means when it says those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life is believe who he is and that he did what he says that he did. Let me translate that in a way that, that maybe you guys won't like as much. <laughs> Believing in Jesus means you've declared war on the sin in your life and that you're serious about growing in your knowledge of God. If there's no seriousness about the sin in your life and no desire for you to grow in your understanding of who God is, who Jesus is, you believe in Jesus like you believe in some kind of historical figure, but you do not believe in him in regards to eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, how can we have confidence in this? How can we really believe this to, to be true and latch on to it? Well, in my 13 years of, uh, with Jessica, I've more than likely broken between 350 to 400 promises, or so she says. No, I'm kidding. She's never said that. Uh, but in that, I've broken some of those promises just out of the, the, the pure nature of that I can be a jerk sometimes. I'm sinful. And maybe out of spite, I just said, okay, I know I said that, but I'm just not going to do it. And you can judge me if you want to, but that's probably happened. The second reason is, I'm just not all powerful. I'm not all knowing. I'm not everywhere at once. So sometimes I've broken promises with no maliciousness intended. 
nothing in my heart. I just simply don't control the universe. For an example, my, my commute to work is, is short and my alternator is crummy. And so sometimes my battery dies. So sometimes I can say, yeah, I'll be home around six. And that simply doesn't happen. There have been promises I've been unable to keep simply because I'm not God. In the same way, there are promises she's made to me that she was unable to keep. Maybe because she's not being very nice in the moment. Probably not. But mostly because she's not God. And, and <clears throat> but the initiating love, oh, that's too far. So I'm not able to always keep my promises. She's not always able to keep her promises. But God stands outside of that. He's not limited as we are limited. God who never breaks his promises, which should bolster our confidence in God's initiating love in the acts of Jesus Christ, which is why we celebrate Easter. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If Jesus dies on the cross but isn't resurrected, how do we know our sin is paid for? If Jesus died on the cross but isn't raised from the dead, how do we know sin has been defeated and death is dead? How do we know if we don't have the resurrection? That the resurrection stands for us as believers as the apex of God's love made manifest in the person and works of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is also what makes us look foolish to the world around us. Like, I'm not ever offended when, when people don't know Jesus think that I'm a fool. Because if you look at the Bible, in, in Genesis 1 and 2, and Revelation 21 and 22, you have these four chapters. And in those four chapters, things go really, really, really well for the followers of God. But then we have the rest. The whole rest of the Bible is for a sorrow and loss and oppression. Do you know that there's an entire book of the Bible called Lamentations? Have you thought about that? There's a whole book that's just lamenting from God's people. We are people who historically, if you pay attention to it, have been, have been slaves, have been oppressed, have been scattered across the earth. We've been killed. We've been crucified. We've been fed to lions. We've been at every angle hard pressed by the world around us, yet woven into that tapestry of all of that is rejoicing. God's people have always been marked as those who rejoice regardless of circumstances. How is that possible? Because we're confident that God in his initiating love has made a way for us to not only be reconciled, but there will be a day where there's a physical resurrection, that Christ in his resurrection is the first fruits of a resurrection from among the dead of all those who believed in the name of Jesus. The Bible says we will throw off what is perishable, this body we're wearing now, and we'll put on what's imperishable, and on that day, 1 Corinthians 15 says that we will actually mock death itself. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? So here's what I'll say to you to close. This is our message. This is all we have. When we gather here week in and week out, this is really all we're talking about. There's just one sermon, and we just keep preaching out a different text. You want to talk about marriage? We go here. You want to talk about raising kids? We go here. You want to talk about money? It's here. Freedom from breaking addictions? Here. Okay. We have to go here. You want to talk about the end of oppression? We go to the cross. Over and over and over again, that the base foundation of all human need is found in the person and the works of Jesus Christ. So when we come together, we relearn this and we sing about this. In fact, all those songs you just sang before I came up here, that's what they were about. Then we open the word of God and we talk about this. And then in different times and seasons, we celebrate this. In fact, God has given us ways in this church to celebrate in a way that mirrors or, or reveals really what, what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And one of those is baptism. In baptism, in baptism someone gets in the water. The water's not magic. It's just city water, the same stuff in your house. But a man or woman gets into that water and they, for the good of the saints, mirror what God has done for us. 
They testify to the saving works of Jesus Christ. They're put under the water, symbolic of the death of Christ. But they don't stay there, right? We rise them back out from the water. They're raised to walk in the newness of life. And what's happening in that moment is we're mirroring, we're showing, we're, we're reminding the saints of a God, uh, of the God that we had that died in Christ but was raised back up again. And it stirs our hope that God's initiating love for Christ, for us in Christ is real, true, good, present, and we need it. And so this Sunday, Easter Sunday, we're gonna fill this baptismal up. We've never done this before, but no one is scheduled to be baptized this Sunday. But anyone here tonight who's ready to take that next step as a believer in Christ, who would like to be baptized, who's ready to publicly commit your life to Christ, we would love to celebrate that decision with you on Sunday on Easter. So after this service, come talk to me or Pastor Lance or Pastor Seth, and we want to set that up for you. Let me pray. Father, Thank you again for your initiating love. Just knowing full well who we are and how we've come here and how we walked into this place, you are good and you do good, Father. Thank you for just the testimony of your life, the testimonies we hear from other people in our lives that show the goodness of God. I pray you would encourage our hearts. I pray in your beautiful name, amen.